I don't think it would be much of a stretch to say that our former publisher, Bill Seidman, would be really proud to have a session like this bear his name. Uh, last night at the cocktail, I wound up in several conversations where people were referencing how Mr. Seidman acted and you know, some of his stances that he took and how it inspired action within institutions of all sizes. And I thought it was really interesting to think about him as we put this particular session together. So how many of you here have heard of Wells Fargo? Pretty much everyone, right? And if you think about the platform from which their CEO speaks, is probably one of the most powerful positions in the United States. So I thought this was really interesting when John Stump said the strength of America's financial system is a result of the diversity of its players. And I can't think of a more diverse but successful group of people uh, than we have here on stage with us this morning. So we have four banks that are represented, and they're from all over the U.S. Uh, they have three common characteristics that I think tie them together. The first is they've got strong earnings that will help with regulatory approval of deals that they want to conduct. They have infrastructures in place that allow them not just to consider an acquisition, but to successfully integrate it into their institution. And I think the last thing is they have some sellers that might be still available in their marketplace, so they could actually think about doing a deal and taking it to the finish line. So rather than me go on and on about Iberia Bank, independent, you know, what's happening at Banner or First Interstate, I thought I'd try to go around and just ask each of our participants, first to introduce themselves, tell, them, tell everyone a little bit about their bank in 90 seconds or less. And since Mark uh, Greskovic from Banner Bank is sitting right next to me, I think I'm going to let you go first. Great. Well, thank you, Al, and uh, good morning, everyone. Banner Bank is uh, approximately a $5 billion uh, commercial bank. We're headquartered in the state of Washington. We, re we currently have uh, 100 offices that cover the Pacific Northwest, specifically Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, and the roots of the company date back 125 years. In 2014, we also announced three different transactions, two of which were uh, Sayusla Bank and the acquisition of American West Bank. And when they are closed in 2015, will be approximately $10 billion, and we'll have 200 offices covering the Pacific Northwest, but also entry in the state of California and Utah. And then David Brooks is sitting right next to him from Independent Bank down in Texas. You want to talk a little bit about yours? Certainly. Uh, thanks, Al. Uh, good morning. Independent Bank, uh, after 25 years as a privately held bank, uh, did an IPO in April of 2013. Uh, we raised approximately $100 million to continue to execute our strategy, which has been pretty simple, uh, organic growth strategy along with strategic acquisitions. Uh, since the uh, IPO in April of, of uh, 13, we've announced four and closed four acquisitions. Uh, we're uh, a little over $4 billion in assets, uh, approximately 40 locations, uh, almost 600 employees across the state. We're headquartered in uh, McKinney, Texas, just north of Dallas. Our footprint primarily covers Dallas, Austin, and Houston, three of the four major metro areas in, in Texas. And David's probably too modest to say that he was one of the first banks to really get back into the IPO space a few years ago, and I think he's been a great example for what's possible if you really tell your story the right way. Thank you. Uh, Iberia Bank is led by Daryl Burden. I thought, Daryl, you might want to share a little bit about yours. Al, oh, thank you very much. Uh, we're a company that's 128 years old. We're about 19 billion in size if you take into consideration the three transactions that we announced in the uh, fourth quarter of the year. I have about 315 locations across 10 states. Uh, and we're in most of the major metropolitan markets around the South. And one of the considerations for our company that I think is pretty important is we are probably geographically a good bit more dispersed than most of our peers in kind of the 10 to $50 billion range. Uh, we've got a couple of good fee businesses. We've had great organic growth. Um, I always focus on having the right people in the right locations and take some energy in going out and looking at branches before we do acquisitions, and I've typically seen about 90% of them, so it means I travel a good bit. Uh, we did 20, we've done 23 transactions since I've been at the company. Um, you know, acquired about 12 to 13 billion in assets, so we've done 13 live banks and three failed banks. Pretty reasonable pricing, so we've been fairly busy. And I keep hearing about your post-integration success, so we're gonna come back to that. Yeah at some point during this uh, conversation. Now, Ed, you're last, but certainly not least. So, Ed Garding, you want to tell us a little bit about First Interstate? I think I'll start with, with uh, the name. For those of you in the audience that have gray hair, you, you may remember 
the First Interstate Bank of California. And, and uh, at one time, they were selling franchise arrangements where you could use their name, their logo, uh, and research and development. And we actually bought into that as a franchisee, uh, but continued to be an independent bank. And when they sold to Wells in 1996, we were the only franchi franchisee they had left and we still had 17 years on the agreement. And so we made a deal with Wells uh, where they said, you take the name and, and drop the agreement. And, and that's how we got to where we're at. Um, as you can see, we're eight and a half billion with 72 branches that are spread out among Montana, Wyoming, and South Dakota. So pretty rural. Uh, we have literally have branches in towns of 1,000 people. <coughs> And, and uh, Billings, Montana headquarters is 125,000 people, and that's the metropolitan area. <laughs> so again, we've got a diversity of participants uh, here with us this morning, and again, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to touch on a number of issues, at least I hope that we're going to be able to get through all this, but one of them is really fundamental to this conference, and that's building franchise value. What does that mean, and how do you think about it from your, in particular, your positions? Uh, growing through acquisition, again, this is a M&A heavy conference, so we want to look at that. You know, this non-bank competition, Walmart, PayPal, eBay, you kind of go down the list. We've already started to hear about the fintech players, the shadow bankers. You know, we would love to get into a conversation about your thoughts. And then this changing demographic, you know, how do you serve customer bases that are, you know, different than they were just a few years ago? And I thought I'd use that really to tee up my <coughs> first question to all of you, but to do so, I want to ask, how many of you went to the beach a few years ago with Tom Friedman's book called The World is Flat? Enough of you that you recognize the title? So this is a New York Times bestseller that seemed to capture a lot of people's imaginations because it talked about how the world was changing and how technology was shifting the way you know, people interacted with each other. And he's written you know, a number of follow-on pieces, but in November, he authored a column for the New York Times that said the world is fast. And I was talking with each of the guys before this conference, and I said, you know, that's kind of an interesting topic, and I'd like to start with that. When I say the world is fast, what do you take from it, and what does it mean to you? And so I'm going to ask each of you just to share your thoughts on that. Great. Well, I think, uh, I think first and foremost, what it means to the banking industry is that we have to get better at anticipating what the future <coughs> needs are for, for our clients. I mean, if you're in a situation where business owners clearly in a very competitive environment want uh, new and cutting edge ways in which they can control costs, improve their delivery channel, then banks as a primary source of the payment business and commerce have to adapt and anticipate what those are. If you think about the old time to uh, delivery or turnaround time on new product technology, it used to be you know six to nine months. We need to move that faster, anticipate what their needs are and be in a position to act quickly. When I think about that, Al, I think uh, it means to me and my franchise that in today's world, with regulation changing the way it is, technology changing the way it is, you better have a strategic plan about how you're going to create value for your shareholders, how you're going to attract and retain the best talent, and, and, uh, and, and, and be able to execute that strategy. And if not, then you need to be thinking, what are you going to do from there? <laughs> sure. Daryl? Well, I, I would start, you know. I think our business is fairly simple, and it always starts with having the right people, whether you're on the consumer side or the commercial side. If you start with the right people and they have the right clients, um, and you're thoughtful about credit because the right clients typically have the best credit, then you're going to do pretty well over the long cycle. Uh, I, th I think what's interesting from a fast perspective today is um, the amount of information and complexity is at a, an entirely different level. Uh, we're trying to manage uh, an amazing amount of information. Uh, you think about the accounting complexity, the accounting rules are getting way more difficult. You know, my chief risk officer dropped a package for our board about this thick on my desk the other day. I looked at him like, really? You know, come on. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we have to figure out how we manage the kind of complexity we're dealing with. Ed? All of the above, uh, uh, but, but I also look at the, the fast thing as, as being a risk management challenge. And, and uh, um, it mo things move so fast that we talk about the, the speed of change in our risk management meetings quite frequently. And 
we keep a list of the, the ten top risks of the company, and one, of, one that's always in the top ten is a surprise. Any uh, color you could provide to what a surprise might, <laughs> might be for you guys? <laughs> well, we, we try to keep enough capital to, uh, you know, I think that, that it's really hard to be ready, but uh, in general, if, if you've got enough capital to absorb a surprise, uh, that gives us some comfort. Okay. Well, so then let's build on that. You know, when you look at putting together a strategic plan, again, in this context of everyone expecting things immediately, you know, how difficult is it for you and your board to think out three, five years? And anyone can raise their hand <laughs> for this one. Look, I think it's something you have to worry, worry about all the time. Yeah, I always tell people, again, the business is pretty simple. Uh, you try not to put too many eggs in any one basket, and you try to be thoughtful about the cycles that you're going through. So I got nervous about energy prices about a year and a half ago, uh, and we had some conversation. Some people said, hey, you're crazy. I'm looking at supply and I'm like, wait a minute, we've got way more supply coming on and the worldwide demand doesn't look that good to me. Uh, but you've got to be in a position to think ahead. And, and again, you talk about the complexities, whether it's accounting, cyber, credit cycles, you know, the non-bank challenge. Uh, there are a lot of challenges out there. And, and, and then you have to be a little bit careful. You talk about messing up. So you get, you get to be in a lineup, not the kind of lineup you want to be in <laughs> uh, if you're not careful with that. <laughs> David? No question. I, I think... Three to five years, really, for as long as I can remember, is about as far out as you can really plan and, and, and understand what's coming uh, down the pike. And, and uh, as Daryl said, I think it's just critical that, that our boards be thinking not about next quarter's earnings or this year's earnings, but be thinking about where do we want this company to be in three to five years and, and be about executing that plan. And, and I think the good boards do that. Sure. And since uh, most people talk about growth being fueled by M&A these days, I assume a lot of the conversation is about what's realistic and you know, what you really want to get out of a potential acquisition. Is that a fair way of thinking about things? Absolutely. I think you have to think about you know, what are the metrics that, that make a difference to you. Are there markets you want to be in that you're not in, markets you want to be stronger in? Those are the things we think about. Uh, and then finding the right partners, finding you know, those banks that, that either complement something we're already doing, help us get into a, a, a market or a niche that we want to be in that we're not in today, uh, and then being disciplined around that, and disciplined, as you mentioned, around the culture sure. you know, of that. Well, since you guys are in the sweetest of sweet spots, according to some presentations, in terms of your asset size, I wanted to ask you, when it comes to a deal, and you're on the acquiring end, what do you look for in a seller? Well, I think... I think the first thing you have to say is exactly what David is talking about. You want to make sure that you're in a position that the organization has created some density for you. At Banner, we run a super community bank model, which means that you have to have a broad product depth, but you deliver it locally in a very responsive fashion. So you have to look at, uh, is there going to be overlap? Are you going to have consolidation, which you can wring out some efficiency? But more importantly, do they have a client base that's loyal, a real uh, strategy associated with their business model, and will it be accretive to the organization in terms of additional growth? So is there a platform? For example, the American West Bank flat platform fits very well with the banner overlap, and it is a launch pad for additional growth in which we can take our business model and layer it into their strategy. Okay. David? No, I... I I think um, it, it's incumbent that we, you know, that we do as as, uh, as Mark was saying that that you that you know what does that bring to the table for us uh, as we go forward. Sure, so. Daryl, do you have additional yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I would. You know, I look at transactions and combinations falling into kind of two categories. You either get the uh, combinations that provide a lot of synergy or you get uh, combinations that provide new flags or new markets to go into. And you kind of want to think about them differently. Uh, and I always think about, you know, when somebody is selling a bank to you, they're really buying into your organization and your currency. So we try to spend a lot of time thinking about the cultural fit and the people and what are we going to accomplish in the market, which is why I always go through the exercise of going out and seeing all the branches. Yeah. Ed? Uh, we look at three things uh, primarily. One is location uh, because we just don't want to get into a, to an area that we don't understand. 
and we also know what we do best, and, and that's that we like to be the, the big player in a small town. And, and so we look at location first, and then we look at market share. Uh, we like to, to acquire someone that has strong market share because we don't believe that, that you can go in uh, to a community with a very small market share and, and um, change that very rapidly. And then third, we look at the loan portfolio, and, uh, mostly in regards to the credit culture, because it's, uh, it's really hard to turn a culture. Uh, you almost have to, have to revolve all the people to do that, and that's tough too. So then let me ask, when you, uh, is there a moment where you know the time is right to buy? Uh, I would say for us, a lot of, of course, it depends on the seller. Um, but what I keep telling our people is that if you wait for the perfect time to do something, you're never going to do anything. <laughs> and, and so the, the moment isn't right. Sometimes you just have to go. Sure. And Daryl, you've done quite a few deals. What yeah. is it for you yeah. that's the trigger? Look, yeah, what, we, what we try to do is we're trying to build relationships uh, with different bankers around the South, and we, we really like the southern United States. And so we spend a lot of time trying to cultivate those relationships, but banks are sold, they're not bought. So your opportunities come up when somebody's ready to do something, and you have to have the right kind of relationship at that point in time to be in the right place, and you have to have the right currency that people respect. Yeah, and I think that actually is a story we've heard from Bank of Houston deciding it was time to you know, find a dance partner and found a successful one with your institution. Right, and I think very much as Daryl just said that you, you have to, in my experience, having created the relationships, and it's a big part of what I think all four of us have to do is be out and about and, and, and understanding um, different franchises, what their strategy is, how they're adding value, and then create those relationships. And then you should know, you know ahead of time in a lot of instances, whether the cultures are a good fit. And so you, you end up, uh, as with our Bank of Houston deal, um, that relationship had been hatched over a couple of years prior to the actual opportunity when they decided, as Daryl said, that they were going to sell. Mm -hmm. And then you know, from there, putting a transaction together wasn't too difficult uh, once we got comfortable with the math. <laughs> so. Well, the numbers always line up at the end, right? They do. <laughs> yes, they do. So let's talk a little bit about getting a deal started. Um, I think for those of you who haven't been through an acquisition, it's helpful to hear you know, from people that have gone through multiple. So can you walk us through you know, kind of either the models you use, the way that you approach the, con the conversation, you know, what you're thinking about internally, you know, whatever that might, might look like? Well, it first starts with uh, economics. I mean, you, you, you basically look at your footprint and say, where would I want to be? Where do I want to expand? Where do I need greater density? And that becomes part of your strategic plan because that's going to model out your growth so that the board understands who it is you might want to be targeting. So it all begins with that. That's the easy piece. Then what you look at is which institutions have similar philosophies, culturally uh, behave the same and would be additive in terms of additional growth and has a minimal amount of execution risk in the integration. The economics will take care of themselves at the end of the day, but you have to make sure that there's a cultural impact, that it adds density to your franchise and builds shareholder value, and that it has a low integration risk. Once you do that, then you can reach out to the partners and say, you know, let's just understand, as Daryl said, create a relationship and understand what the values of that organization is and what they're looking to do going forward. Okay. Ed, do you feel similarly? We actually have a written acquisition strategy, and, and um, in it we try to identify targets, and, and we'll have the, what we think are the strengths, and are they low, medium, high, and in regards to location, <coughs> size, credit, culture. And then typically what happens is, is uh, uh, one of our friends in the investment banks calls us about a deal that's not even close to being on the list, and we get excited, and, and <laughs> the strategy goes out the window. And, and, uh, but we do have a strategy. Oh, those phone, oh, those phone calls. <laughs> well, so, um, so Daryl, since you've had a chance to look at so many deals that you've decided not to do, you know, what are some of the things that would prohibit or prevent you from wanting to take even the first few exploratory steps? Sure. Well. 
Yeah, it goes back. We, we have a strategic process around M&A that's pretty disciplined. We have, uh, we, re we have a report we provide our board at every board meeting. It's a very exhaustive list of banks that we kind of put in three buckets. And, um, and we're pretty disciplined about you know, what, what we're looking for. We have, we've already done models and everything like that on all the banks. So we have, it's pretty exhaustive. But you know, what, what I'll do, and, it, and it's why it's important to go make sure you know what you're buying, is I'm trying to make sure the people fits right um, in terms of the kind of leadership you're getting and, and their ability to get clients. And then you're trying to look at branches. I've, I've been involved in situations where we go out and look at the branches and I'm like, yeah, I understand why they have real high deposit costs because their branches are really ugly, <laughs> you know, and, and that's probably not going to be too interesting to us. Um, and sometimes you meet the people and you're like, nah, their risk spectrum and my risk spectrum are two different things. Uh, and sometimes you have to make tough decisions because we looked at a market not too long ago and from a concentration perspective, we like the bank, I like the people, but I stepped back and said, you know, that's going to create a concentration in an area for me that I'm not willing to accept. And you just have to think it through. So it's, uh, but you have to be extremely disciplined about it. Sure. Right, and, and I think you figure out, as, as my colleagues have said, where you want to be and, and, and not be over-concentrated. We want to continue to build market share in places like Austin and Dallas and Houston. Um, but then to, to take a look at the earnings and vis-a-vis and, and -vis what the price expectations are of the seller. So we've seen you know, a lot of deals uh, in, in Texas in particular last year, the price expectations of the sellers are so high uh, and, and there's been just a steady increase in the valuation such that, and I know Daryl's thought the same thing uh, in Texas is, you know, there's been no kind of incentive. Every deal that gets announced is higher than the deal before, so you might as well wait and, and, and try to get a better price. But then once you get inside uh, what Ed said earlier around the credit culture ends up <coughs> causing us to back away from more deals than anything else. If someone's risk perspective and, and how they view credit risk is different than ours, then that's a deal breaker for us. Yeah, when it comes to the pricing expectation, you know, being, you know, not really aligned, is there a way for you to almost begin a conversation that tries to bring it back if it's interesting enough to you? Or do you just say, like, if that's where you are, then we're not even gonna spend any time trying to see if this is possible? Well, I think the comment earlier was, you know, banks are sold, um, you know, they're not bought. And I think, and the comment was also made earlier that they have to be buying into your organization, your stock. So, you know, it's, I think we all face the same issue, which is putting together a format for presentation to a likely target that says you're buying into the value proposition of the combined organization and the future uh, shareholder growth. And that's really where you have to position it to bring the economics back into reality of saying, on a combined basis, here's where the growth's gonna come from for your shareholders. Sure. So I took a note and I brought it up here with me because um, CIT did a deal this summer with One West. And when that was being announced, there was some speculation that uh, buyers might be eyeing deposits, not really assets. And it basically suggests that, you know, they're preparing for an increase in loan demand and so looking at some of these charts and seeing that loan demand is really slack, that just seems a little, a little bit odd to me. But if they're positioning themselves for rising interest rates, that's interesting. So I'm curious to get each of your takes on you know, what this means. If buyers are increasingly eyeing deposits and not assets and kind of how you would think about it from your vantage point. Well, well at Banner, we run a loan to deposit ratio uh, that's north of 90%. So for us, deposits are critical, obviously, to fund our growth. Um, and you know, as long as I've been in this business almost 30 years, I've always been deposit starved. So you know, deposits are the key to a low funding cost that allows the organization, I think the comment was made earlier by your editor that, that institutions with a higher net interest margin and a lower funding cost tend to outperform over the longer term. Well, that would imply that you have a strong core deposit base. So deposits are, are very valuable and they'll continue to be valuable. The only other thing I'd add is cross-selling is so critical to our business and generating additional fee income. I don't know how you cross-sell a client you don't have. So the, the, the core deposit is still the linchpin of, of having a strong client base that you can cross-sell. Sure. Similarly to Mark, we've been able to generate loans over the years. So Core deposits have been critical as we've looked at other 
institutions. Uh, we really look at the quality of that deposit base very early in the, in the process. And even as Mark said, sometimes before we even meet the people, we know what that deposit base looks like and, uh, and spend time on that. So uh, deposit, you know, interest rates rise and decline. Core deposits are key to, our, to building a real franchise, in my opinion, uh, and have been and always will be. I would start, you know, look, we've had mid teenish ish kind of loan growth uh, consistently every year since I've pretty much been at the company. And so you always have to think about deposits as kind of fuel for the fire. So, you know, you, try to, you always try to balance that out. And the other one I think people ought to consider, um, it's, it's the timing of the value. And I'd, I'd be a little careful about getting too, too much ahead of that when you've got a 10-year that's uh, about a buck 80 uh, down from three-something. Uh, you probably ought to be thinking about what the market's telling you. Ed. In regards to an acquisition, if, if, if uh, what you're getting is deposits, I think you've got to adjust the price accordingly because uh, all of us would rather buy earning assets uh, in order to make that acquisition pay for itself more quickly. But that said, there there's a huge focus on liquidity these days, you know, from the uh, regulators and, and uh, in CIT's case, I, I think that because of their size, there there's some new liquidity rules that that, uh, that we at smaller sizes don't have yet. Anyway, I um, I would guess that they're paying for liquidity. Uh, liquidity isn't free, and it is important. Well, let's come back a little to the cross-selling of customers, and that naturally leads to the culture that you'd be bringing in to an organization and the culture that you already have. So can you talk a little bit about you know, the roles and responsibilities that you might set for your team and then the expectations you have when it comes to culture? Because I've heard from a number of CEOs, it's one of, if not the most important long-term you know, drivers is can we successfully take these two organizations and make them one? And that starts at the top. And I think each of you probably takes a slightly different approach to developing a culture that can be consistent throughout an organization. Well, I'll jump into this. I think uh, Daryl mentioned there's two types of acquisitions that you look at. One is, are you creating efficiency, so cutting cost and, and wringing out uh, the revenue piece. The other, the other side is new platform for growth. And so it, it, at the beginning of any integration process, you have to take a look and say, is the organization on a combined basis going to focus and be client-centric? for revenue growth. Most of the acquisitions that, that you look at have a cost structure component that you want to cut costs, but you try and you know, decide, can I really get the revenue? So you have to immediately have an embracing of the sales process, embracing of the product is, do you have the right product mix? And can you cross sell deeper into the, into the client base that you're buying? That's how Banner looks at it. Okay. We're more of a commercial wholesale private banking strategy, so we don't have a lot of retail uh, component. And, and we, we look at that and, and we see it a lot of times in our acquisition uh, candidates or acquisition partners is, you know, they may have had a more retail uh, approach. And, and if so, uh, you know, how does that fit with what we do? And, and uh, a lot of times, if, if you're, to, to Mark's point, if, if, you, if your model relies on a lot of cross-sell and a lot of, you know, lobby retail cross-sell, uh, that's a whole different kind of employee than you might have in a, in a more traditional community bank uh, across the country. So I just think you have to be aware of that and that culture fit, again, is a big reason why sometimes you have to say this probably isn't the best uh, sure. fit for us. Yeah, I would, I would start the synergistic transactions that provide the kind of cost saves that we talk about. Uh, those are, those are pr provide an immediate step up in operating leverage. So that's a great thing, but you have to remember that over time that diminishes. So, you know, I, sp I spent a lot of time focusing on the new markets and the new places we want to be and the new teams. And typically what I do is I'll, I'll either try to develop a relationship where I, I, I know whether the cultural fit's going to be there or not, uh, or get out in the market and ask about the people and, and see what the people in the market think. Or many places when we're going into a market, I don't know how I'm going to get there yet, I go to that market and try to meet bankers there and try to figure out if I went to this market, who would I want to have at my bank? Yeah. And uh, we probably have one, one advantage, or, and, and I think I'm the poster child of my company. I've lived in nine different markets in six different states across the South. <laughs> so I know a lot of people, so I can typically <laughs> network and find out. <laughs> Ed, any thoughts? 
I agree with Daryl. Get, getting to know uh, the target people is extremely important. And there's a lot of talk about culture, and, and so we define it uh, um, just the word culture. And, and uh, in our shop, uh, we say that uh, culture is the way people behave when nobody's watching them. And, and I have to be watched at all times, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but um, we, so we try to, to spend more time uh, displaying uh, <clears throat> our values than talking about them. And, and we think people pick that up. Sure. Well, um, you know, we joked a little bit that the numbers always add up in the end. So from my standpoint, a transaction doesn't fail because of the math or, you know, the initial spirit. There's really post-integration risks that you're assuming when you get into conversation. And I'm curious how you each look at some of the post-integration risks, what you think are the most important, and then maybe some of the steps that you've recently taken to mitigate them. And so maybe we could go in reverse order and have Ed start on that path. I got to think about this a minute. Uh, um, I go back to, to risk management and credit quality. I, I think the, the, the biggest risk is, is uh, not properly analyzing that loan portfolio and, and uh, finding out that, that you've got more problems than you realized and that your lenders are, uh, that you've inherited are weaker than what you thought. Daryl? I'll take it from, from two directions. First, um, we, try, we try to make sure we've kind of evaluated kind of the, the pricing versus risk perspective. So, you know, do you like the loans? Do you think some of the loans are going to run off? Do you think some of the customers are going to run off? Some of the people are going to leave you? How does that risk run against pricing? And you want to make sure it's balanced. And by the way, you always have to be willing to walk away from something. If you don't have the discipline to do that, uh, I can think of a lot of different places in life you're not going to do very well. <laughs> so, um, you yeah, know, you got to do that. And, um, you know, then it's a matter of thinking uh, where and what is it that I want to do and try to flip it around and think it from that direction. Sure. Well, I think our tendency as an acquirer is to be optimistic about the post. You know, we, we've closed on four banks, as I mentioned, the last couple of years, 11 in the last 10 years. And, you know, the integrations have gone, you know, generally very well, but, but I can think of some that went better than others. And, and so we always try to keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of it does have to do with integration on the credit side as much as anything. Uh, we tend to think of an acquisition not in that regard, not dissimilarly from when we're talking to a, a lender or a team of lenders and say, you know, the worst possible outcome here is if we end up six months down the road and you can't get your deals approved that you want to do and we're not happy with your production and uh, you know that just makes for a bad kind of marriage and so we try to figure those things out up front and, and the same thing on the M&A side. We try to think about what it's going to be like six or 12 months down the road and how quickly, how quickly can we get past an us versus them kind of mentality and mm -hmm. a lot of that starts with leadership in our, in our opinion. Uh, if, if you think the leaders there will lead their team into a strong integration and we have that expectation, then that works great. If, uh, if we think, and, and sometimes we're our own worst enemies, right, as, as community bankers because we're so fiercely independent and, uh, and we're proud of that. And yet, you know, when you make a decision to sell your company and become a part of another organization, you, you need to be buying into that philosophy and that approach. And if you can't, then it's probably not a good, good match. Sure. Mark? I don't have anything much more to add other than the biggest post-integration risk that I've experienced really revolves around do you have the right people in place? And you have to make that decision very quickly because culturally, if they aren't client-centric and they aren't focused and willing to adapt to a new style or philosophy on how you're going to be in the, in the new combination, there is always going to be some impact to the client because there, there's going to be conversions, and how they manage that, that communication with the client is critical. And if they're not on board, if they're not part of the combined culture, that, that can, can become a disaster. So that, to me, is the most important piece in recognizing up front and admitting to yourself that this, there, we have to make a change. Mm -hmm. Daryl? Yeah, I, would, I would add one 
thing I didn't mention uh, that I think is pretty important. Um, when, you're, when you're doing an integration, and we run a market-focused or a market-oriented kind of uh, ability, not a line of business. So we, let, we want people in the markets to run their franchise. But what I have to watch out for is I have to make sure that I don't have a bunch of middle, middle managers going in and telling the people you know, how to cow eat the cabbage <laughs> and, and driving them crazy and running them off. And, and it's a real integration risk, and it's one I spend a lot of time saying, hey, guys, you know, ease up. You know, we want this person to run their market. We want them to have some fun with this. And uh, I don't want a whole bunch of people running in and driving them crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a huge risk. Well, you know, to that point, maybe each of you could just share an anecdote or, or something that's happened, you know, that's been unexpected when you've done a deal that you're proud of. You know, you talk about culture and bringing these teams together. You know, is there anything that stands out about a recent transaction where you say, well, I'm really excited or proud of this that might benefit everyone that's here? Yeah, I can, I can think of one real, real quick. And again, I think it's, it's a, it, it depends on your style and the way you want to run your company. But a, but a huge win is when you acquire somebody and the CEO of the company starts calling over the banks saying how much they like having done a deal with you. <laughs> That's a huge win. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other thing is when you know that the bankers that you're acquiring are extremely excited about it. And for example, it's a fine line, but for example, with the American West transaction, even though we're scheduled to close that transaction in the, second, the end of the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter of 2015, we've already be begun client calls. So I've already been introduced to a number of their clients and it's been embraced. You know, that's when it truly is successful when they say this, com the bankers are saying this combination makes all the sense in the world for our client and, and our community. And we've made community contributions as well, even prior to the closing of the acquisition, and it's been embraced <coughs> in the community. So those little things end up being very successful for the integration process. Sure. I think that then naturally lends itself to the customer loyalty side of your business, which brings to me to my next question. It's all about the disintermediation of the financial space by technology companies. And you know what's happening today, you know, there's so much written about you know, Walmart or, you know, in the past trying to get into banking and, you know, PayPal and what they're trying to do, Venmo in the, you know, you know, the payment space. But then you also hear about Capital One, who's decided they want to make a much bigger push and really shift their business from being a, quote, analog one to a digital one. They're making acquisitions. You see investments being, you know, funded in significant amounts by some of the biggest banks, you know, specifically out on the West Coast. So I'm curious, banks of your size are not normally discussed as potential acquirers of technology companies. You know, and here we're talking about acquiring other banks, but would you guys ever consider buying a technology company? Well, I'll start with that. You know, <laughs> Banner, Banner's business model is a super, super community bank ma model. So I may have a little bit different perspective than some of the other members. You know, our, the most <coughs> important part about strategy is we develop strategy and it's been successful for us is not necessarily knowing what you want to be, it's knowing what you don't want to be. So we are very good at client uh, solution delivery. We're not very good at technology. <laughs> so being in a position where your vendors or you're partnering with people that are on the edge of, of saying what is important in the future and being able to partner with them is critical. Acquiring them is an entirely different business model uh, and strategically doesn't necessarily align itself with a super community bank. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that for us. From, uh, from Mark's standpoint, some of our most important relationships as we deal with this dinner, disintermediation and technology are with our, our vendor partners. And um, those are critical relationships. We spend a lot of time on it, a lot of time thinking about technology and where that's going. Um, I, I don't think a bank our size is, is a natural buyer for a technology company. Uh, you know, Al, I, I think you always invest in technology. You try to do it consistently. You don't want to, you don't want to have any um, bubbles that you have to go out and, and create. So, you know, if you invest consistently, I think you end up kind of in the right, right place. What, what is interesting and, and one of the uh, really fun things for me is to go to Europe and, and look at where Europe is from a technology perspective because the banks there are way ahead of the banks in the U.S. And, uh, and that's kind of fun to watch. It's a nice trip, too. Uh, yeah, it <laughs> doesn't hurt. Ed? Uh, I agree with David on, from the standpoint of size matters. And I, I think if you're buying a, a big technology company, you better be a very large bank and, uh, so that you can absorb the risk if it doesn't work. 
Uh, that said, we did buy a technology company, uh, but it was very small. It was a, a 12 person web design, most, <coughs> mostly what they did was web design company. And, and um, what we got out of it was the talent. Uh, uh, we got a bunch of, of young guys who combed their hair up instead of down. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and we needed, uh, uh, we needed that kind of talent in the bank. And we didn't really make use of the company they had, but, but we made use of their expertise. Sure. So then, um, yeah, if I could ask you to finish this question, or finish this statement, rather. In 2015, the biggest investment I intend to make is, and you fill it in and you maybe explain why you would take that approach. Well, for us, uh, the biggest investment is in people, in developing, retaining, and attracting strong talent uh, for our organization. You know, it's the, it's the largest expense item we have. Uh, so we have to continue to find ways to invest effectively to, um, to train people and make them excited about our industry. Uh, the talent, there is a talent dearth of, of folks willing to be in the banking space. Um, the folks that are combing their hair up want to be on the technology side, not necessarily mm -hmm. the bank side. So, um, so it's incumbent upon us to continue to invest and that'll be the biggest place we invest our dollars. Yeah, same. Uh, we intend to continue to hire terrific teams of people, uh, identifying, uh, attracting them. And then uh, one risk we haven't talked a lot about today, though, is as you continue to grow, your culture does change and will naturally change. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to spend time. And I sit down with you know, the, the person in our company that runs all of human resources across our markets uh, really weekly to brainstorm about you know, what's going well, what's not going well, how can we keep this, and, and, and Daryl hit it, I think, on allowing people as much flexibility as you can to run their markets, but then, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're filing all the regulatory reports properly and, <laughs> and doing all those things so you don't get put in the penalty box. And, and so it's a, it's a tight rope to walk, but I think it's a challenge for all of us to make sure that, that our companies continue to be exciting places to work and places where talent wants to go. Uh, Al, it's always about people. I mean, the team that has the best people typically wins, uh, regardless of what the sport or what the activity would be. I would say that, that this year, we're gonna, I'm going to focus a lot on do we have the right people in charge of areas that have unusual complexity, uh, because I think that's a growing risk for us. Such as? Uh, you think any of the accounting, you think cybersecurity, I mean, there are you know, technology, a bunch of different places you can go with that, but there are, I think, key areas where you better have the right people. And you, and you might want to go, if, you, if you're in a company that's grown a lot, you might want to step back and say, okay, let's make sure we haven't outgrown some of our people. Sure. Ed? I'll make it unanimous on, the, right? on the people. Uh, <laughs> we uh, specifically, uh, in our case, we want to spend a lot of time on leadership training. We, we have an awful lot of people near retirement age and, and uh, I keep saying that, that if we're going to be a good company, we have to last more than one generation. Well, so last year when we had this panel, I uh, tried to wrap it up by saying if I had a magic wand and I passed it around and I said you could change one thing without consequence or expense, what would it be? Somebody said, you know, it's not to change, but I just want to know what a qualified mortgage is. And that was their answer. Um, you guys want to try to best that one? If I pass you the proverbial magic wand and say you can change anything, no consequence, no expense. Wow, that's wonderful. Isn't um, that great? Yeah, I'd like one of those. The, I, think, I think from my perspective, it really would be to have a strong credit and sales training program for individuals coming right out of college. I think that has been lax for our industry for a number of years. And I think, you know, the, through the financial crisis, we had such a bad reputation that was promoted by, by so many people that we need to focus on trying to get young people interested in this business. This has been a tremendous business for me, a wonderful opportunity of growth and understanding and, and, and change. We need to try and find a way to get that excitement into the younger people to bring them into our industry. And, and training programs had done that. That's how I came through the business. Yeah. All right. So we got one for the training program. One for the training program. I guess my thought would be broad and, and really a, a broader thought on, on what your <coughs> panelists said last year, and that is just 
clarity around the environment that we're going to be operating in, you know, kind of, I think if we understand what the rules are, you know, most every bank CEO that I know across the country would like to comply, wants to, you know, do the right thing. It's just sometimes difficult to know uh, what those things are. So just any clarity we can get around, you know, from accounting to regulatory uh, issues, I think the better off our industry will be. Okay, so we're going to put like a magic eight ball right on your desk. And right you just up. ask it a question, and it'll just tell you what you want. There it is. <laughs> Daryl? All right, I want, I want all my commercial lenders to have $200 million portfolios of loans <laughs> and deposits <laughs> with really good rates and great credit. How about that? Uh, <laughs> Finally, an honest lot, answer. We make a lot of money like that. <laughs> Ed? I actually seriously want to want to get back to the focus of being on the customer. Um, we and, and I think the whole industry is going that way. We've become very internally focused because uh, you know we've got all this regulatory change, risk management, governance. Uh, we're a public company, and, and <coughs> we can go through several meetings without ever mentioning the word customer. And I'm going to try to turn that around. Well, a noble request. So uh, we've basically come to the end of our time with our four wonderful participants. Could we give them all a round of applause, please? <laughs> <laughs>